So will you tell me whenever you want me to start? Yeah, okay. So I'll just make the introduction then. So good morning, friends. Good morning, everyone. Uh, here I welcome you to the special lecture by uh, Shri Prashant Bhushanji, who is a very well-known, noted lawyer of public and trust litigation in India. In fact, uh, if I could say that we have always associated with him for, for the social causes and learned the uh, art of public and trust litigation, also some of me, uh, you know, like me, who have not been uh, practicing at the bar, but we have all to him in terms of understanding the various nuances of social causes. And uh, legal activism is something which is very important for the lawyers, for the law graduates to learn. And especially, I would say, from the perspective of ethical approach to the public interest litigation. Sir has been associated with the Center for Public Interest Litigation, with People's Union for Civil Liberties, and Transparency International. Also, as we all would probably remember, Sir was one of the very key and important members of India Against Corruption movement that was started by Anna Hazare. Sir has been uh, filing public interest litigation on a lot of social causes, and which ranges probably over 500 now. And one of the very striking uh, features and one of the very striking you know, factors why I thought you know, it's going to be also relevant for us at the virtual law school to invite Sir is that we have Sir started on a pro bono note. And you are known, you have been doing a lot of cases uh, pro bono. And if I'm not wrong, as, as I have known, that you perhaps take only 25% of the fees as you know, compared to a lot of lawyers. And most of your cases are there which you, for which you do not charge for any brief, but you do that pro bono. And in that regard, in fact, be it the issue of judicial accountability, government accountability. So you have been trying to keep a check. You have been trying to make all of us, in fact, a more robust informed citizenry by way of filing these public interest litigations, uh, ranging from the 2G spectrum case where you are involved to the uh, uh, striking down of the appointment of uh, P.J. Thomas as the Central Vigilance Commissioner after he got, you know, uh, labeled in the case of uh, Palomino oil import uh, scam, and the Supreme Court also, you know, looked into it positively and struck down the uh, appointment. So they've been in your stand on the death penalty case and uh, also public interest litigation in coal block allocation and cancellation in 2012. So the cases and the range of all these, you know, kind of social causes go on and on. And it's our really good fortune that you could give us this time in morning today on 11th of May to come and address the students. As sir, I've told you over the phone and also briefed you that this is an initiative of a law teacher as my initiative. I have just left my active uh, uh, academic job and taken up this uh, initiative of virtual law school because when I was teaching, so I realized uh, by way of all nine classes during this pandemic, that a lot of students get left out. And not everyone is fortunate to go to the NLUs or also the state uh, leading universities where the cost of education ranges from somewhere you know, close to 1,20,000 or it goes up to 2,20,000 and so on and so forth. Leaving aside some of the other leading private universities which are charging over 5 lakhs. So uh, I've always been you know, looking at this particular issue that how the cost of legal education has been so tremendously high. And not that everyone, every law student who then comes out of that law school is getting absorbed in the job market with that you know, sort of a pay package that they can repay their education loans. And that's why during this time, I've started it off pandemic in the pandemic time as a pro bono. And then there's a lot to follow in terms of the legal education that I'm trying to look forward to. So on that note, sir, I welcome you. And uh, uh, just to see if you will join in a short file but we can then mean in, uh, we can start with the lecture. So welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you, Nachiketa. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad that uh, you've started this uh, forum for online law lectures, uh, so that many more people can watch these and attend these. And I'm happy to be here to talk about a subject which I feel I know uh, something about and that is public interest litigation and the ethical uh, way of approaching public interest litigation. So <clears throat> first thing that we uh, must ask when we think of a public interest case is, what is the 
what is the important public interest involved in the issue which we want to take up. And in order to understand whether this involves a serious issue of public interest or not, we need to first consult all the relevant top experts on that issue. Not all, but at least a fairly representative section. Meaning you need to have a very good grip and understanding of the issue that you want to take up to court by way of a public interest litigation. So uh, suppose you want to take up the case of say Delhi air pollution. Let, I'm just giving an example. Uh, and you feel that something needs to be done uh, and you may also have some idea of what needs to be done. Firstly, of course, it's useless to go to court and say Ki, there is a lot of pollution in Delhi and court should pass orders to stop the pollution. That is of no use because court, you can go to court and ask the court to pass an order to end corruption, but that's also of no use. Such a general direction will be of no use it can't be implemented. Similarly, uh, so therefore, you first need to have an idea of what is it that needs to be done to curb air pollution. Hmm. And then you need to consult the top experts in that field, or at least the experts that you can access, and you should try and access the best experts first. Find out who are the best experts in this field who have studied this issue thoroughly, even experts who may have some vested interest in the matter. You see, it is not necessary that every expert who has a vested interest in the matter will say something which is of no value or no use. So you should consult uh, experts, even those who are working in a particular industry which may have some direct bearing on the issue of air pollution. And you must also consult all other independent experts on that issue, particularly independent experts, in order to get a full grip of what the problem is, what the issue is. Once you feel that you have a good understanding of the issue and the, uh, a good understanding of the solution to that issue, then the first thing that you need to think of is, okay, all right, if I go to court, what is the prayer that I will ask for? What is it that I want? What order do I want the court to pass? And once you have an understanding of the order that you want the court to pass, firstly, it should be a specific executable order, not a vague order, which is not capable of being implemented or executed like ending corruption or ending pollution, etc. These are vague orders which are not capable of being implemented. So therefore, you have to think of a specific order that you want from the court. And the, then the next thing that you need to think of is, what is the legal or constitutional basis for seeking that prayer? That is, can the court issue such an order? Then is it within the power and jurisdiction of the court to issue such an order? Because normally the court will only issue an order, which is to implement either a right of the people or to prevent a violation of the law or the constitution. So therefore, you have to ask yourself, what is the legal basis? What is the right that I am seeking to implement? by way of, or what is the right which has been infringed uh, by this action or inaction of the government or any authority, etc. And therefore, what is the right that the court will be implementing when it issues such an order? Or what is the, uh, uh, what is the law which is being infringed? Which law do you want to implement? and uh, which is the provision of the constitution. I mean, it is not necessary that every EIL must be founded on violation of the constitution. It could even be for violation of any law or for implementation of any right. 
So therefore, it's very important to have an understanding of the legal basis on which you are seeking that prayer. Thereafter, and here we need to understand what is, because we often hear the courts cannot interfere with the government on policy matters, which is correct, that it is not the business of the court to substitute the judge's own feelings or views on a particular public issue and say, okay, well, this should be done uh, and what the government is doing is wrong, etc. Uh, so what is the difference between a purely policy issue and an issue which involves violation of rights or violation of any law or constitution? Because uh, even a policy of the government can be challenged if it's violative of any fundamental right or if it is uh, malafide, if it's violative of a constitution, of the law, of any fundamental right, or if it is malafide. There can be an instance of a policy which is malafide, where the government has framed that policy in order to, if it is clear that this policy has been framed in order to benefit a particular lobby, then you can challenge that policy even on the ground that it is malafide. Now, I'll give you an example. For example, today there is this COVID crisis. There is a lockdown. Uh, it has led to all kinds of consequences. It has led to migrant workers, people losing their jobs, their being without money. They're wanting to go back home, being unable to go back home because of the lockdown, because of lack of any public transport, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on the one hand, whether the lockdown should be there or not hmm, can be said to be a matter of policy because government has to weigh all kinds of things whether the infection will spread very rapidly if the lockdown were not there uh, versus the impact on jobs, on economy, et cetera, and on other uh, travel rights of the people, et cetera. So therefore, in that sense, the decision of the government to impose a lockdown or not can be said to be a matter of government policy. But, as I said, no policy can be violative of fundamental rights. Now, if the effect of this lockdown is, or the manner in which the lockdown is being implemented is, that uh, migrant workers are losing their jobs, their money, and even access to food, which has been declared to be a fundamental right under Article 21 of the Constitution, that every person has a fundamental right to live with dignity. And therefore, if you are depriving him of that right, uh, that gives rise to an actionable claim that, look, we must, these migrant workers must be, even if you implement a lockdown, they must be provided some food or money to meet their basic requirements. And if the government's lockdown has resulted in their being deprived of all that, then it is the government's responsibility to provide them with at least that, unless, unless there is a situation that it is not possible for the government to do that. If it is not possible, obviously you can't ask the court to issue an order which is not capable of being complied with because the government has no money. It can happen. Occasionally, it can happen. But if the government has money and the government can provide some wages or some uh, uh, food, etc., to these people, and it is not doing that, that certainly gives rise to an actionable claim. Similarly, the question of whether they should be allowed to travel back to their to their homes. Now, uh, government can say, okay, look, if they travel back, then they are likely to spread this infection and therefore we will not allow them to travel back. Then what about 
why not test them and see if they are free of this COVID virus or free of symptoms, then why should they not be allowed to travel back? If because the right to move freely across the country is a fundamental right on which reasonable restrictions can be imposed, but the uh, restrictions must be reasonable. You can't say that even if a person is free of this virus, then also he should not be allowed to travel back so long as he can do so safely. Similarly, if you have allowed, if the government has allowed the students from quota to be brought back to their home states or to their homes and travel across the states, or they have allowed the pilgrims in Haridwar to be brought back from Haridwar to Gujarat, then it is patently discriminatory not to allow these migrant workers to go back home under similar circumstances. So therefore, <clears throat> there is a violation of Article 19 right, that is the right to travel freely. There is a violation of the Article 14 right, and there is a violation of Article 21 right, because if in the place where they are staying, if they have no jobs and no money, and they are totally destitute, and they have no money for food also, at least when they go back home in their own farms, etc., they will have some food. So therefore, uh, it's also a violation of their Article 21 rights. So therefore, those issues are actionable. But as to whether there should be a lockdown or not can be said to be a matter of policy. Uh, now, one issue which frequently arises is whether a person who is interested or if a person who has some vested interest in an issue, whether he can file a PIL or not. In my view, some courts have taken the position, even the Supreme Court has occasionally taken the position that if a person has some vested interest in an issue, then he can't file a PIL. In my view, that's not a correct uh, position of law. Uh, if he is raising a matter of public interest, then whether or not he has a vested interest in the matter, that PIL should be entertained. It's another matter that if the court feels that that person will not pursue the case dispassionately in public interest, then the court can always remove him as the petitioner and appoint an amicus to pursue that issue, but to, rem but to dismiss that issue, if it, uh, if it raises an important actionable issue of public interest, purely on the ground that uh, a person with a vested interest has filed it, is totally wrong. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court has been doing it in some uh, cases. Um, then there is an issue of whether fees should be charged by lawyers who file these PIs. Now, I have, as a matter of uh, as a matter of rule, as a matter of principle, I have never charged any fees for any PI. PILs are always done pro bono, and the reason why I follow that principle or policy is that in a PIL, the lawyer has to see himself virtually as an amicus who is assisting the court in public interest. That is the duty of a PIL lawyer to see himself as an amicus, and therefore he must be somewhat detached from any vested interest or any. So what happens is that usually the only people who are willing to pay the fees of a lawyer for a PIL are people who have some vested interest on, in the matter. And therefore, if you take fees from that person, then you will feel obliged to argue what he is asking you to argue, or to put forward his point of view, and not the point of view which you consider is the correct point of view in public interest. So therefore, for that reason, it's important for a lawyer, for a PIL lawyer, not to charge fees for public interest cases. Of course, there are other cases that a PIL lawyer normally also does, like I do. I do, I would say, maybe 
two thirds of my cases or maybe three fourths of my cases are public interest cases. The remaining are private cases. Among private cases, if there is a very, very poor person who comes to me, uh, who I feel has suffered great injustice and who, ob who obviously cannot pay my fees, then I, I do it pro bono for him also. But for other people, you can charge fees. So therefore, and since lawyers' fees these days are quite high, a public interest lawyer who does even 75% public interest work uh, and does not charge anything for that 75% of his time, even with that 25% of his time for doing normal paid work, he can make enough money to, uh, for his normal uh, needs and comforts, etc. Uh, which is what I have been doing. <coughs> now, PILs are of various kinds. Uh, PILs can be, firstly, to enforce some socio-economic rights of the poor. That was the original concept of PILs. Uh, when PILs started in the early 80s or late 70s or early 80s, Court said that these are for enforcing the rights of poor people or disadvantaged people who are unable to approach the court. So, for example, the rights of slum dwellers, the rights of rickshaw pullers, the rights of prison inmates, the rights of uh, street vendors, these are examples of those kind of uh, PILs which are for enforcing socio-economic rights of the poor. But thereafter, there came another category of PILs, firstly dealing with environmental issues, which affect everybody. These are general issues which affect everybody across the board. Corruption affects everybody across the board. It just doesn't affect only the poor, it affects everybody. So when anybody moves a PIL on an issue of environment or corruption, he is also an interested party in that sense. Just as general public is interested in ensuring that corruption does not take place, that the public exchequer is not looted, that uh, the environment is not spoiled, that the air is not polluted, rivers are not polluted. So everybody is interested. So, so the court held that, yes, the, that is fine. Uh, these are all also public interest issues which will be taken up because the court said that uh, the right to live in a clean environment is part of your right to life. The, the right to live in a corruption-free society is also part of your right to life. And therefore, uh, those kind of PILs also were entertained, the Colgate case or the 2G case or... <clears throat> uh, the environmental cases are all examples of that, that Buddha Burman case, etc. Then there is a third category of PILs which also came and which are very important. These are PILs regarding institutional reforms. So, for example, <clears throat> the CBI was completely controlled by the government and was being used for its political ends by the government. So in order to give it some measure of autonomy so that it could pursue, enforce the law rather than execute the orders of their political masters, the court in that Vinit Narayan said that uh, in order to insulate the CBI from the strangulating control of the government, certain things need to be done. You place it under the supervisory jurisdiction of the CBC, make the CBC independent of the government, you give the director of CBI an independent tenure, his selection should be by a larger panel rather than by the government itself. Selection should involve, the selection committee should include the chief justice, etc., and the leader of opposition. Same thing, same kind of, similar kind of directions were issued in the uh, Prakash Narayan's case, which involved general police reforms. So the court said these kind of institutional reforms are essential in order to curb corruption or in order to ensure that the police performs its duty to enforce the rule of law 
rather than function as an instrumentality of the government. Uh, same thing, <clears throat> same issue was raised uh, uh, about this master of roster. See, unfortunately, the court did not accept that, uh, the Supreme Court, but the same issue was raised that, look, allowing the Chief Justice alone control of the roster, it may be a convention, it may be a long-standing convention, but it is a convention which is concentrating excessive power on one person so that if the government somehow is able to influence that one person, the government is able to get its important cases decided, fixed before convenient benches and decided in particular ways, which is the issue which was raised by four judges of the Supreme Court in a press conference that they addressed two and a half years ago. <clears throat> that January 2018 press conference addressed by Justices Chalmeshwar, Madan Lokur, uh, Gogoi, and Korean Joseph was because of that, because they said that this Chief Justice is exercising his power as master of the roster in a malafide manner at that point of time. And therefore, this institutional reform, which we went to court for, saying that instead of having that power with the Chief Justice alone, that power should be vested with a collegium of five senior judges. Just as in the case of appointment of judges, the court decided that no, the power to select judges instead of being only with the chief justice should vest with a collegium of senior judges. Because that is essential for ensuring that proper judges or at least better judges get selected. Same way, this was essential. But unfortunately, that was one case where the Supreme Court turned down our request. So um, these are the few things that I wanted to share about PILs and the ethical way of uh, lawyering about public interest litigation. I am happy now to take any questions around these issues. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now, uh, Justice Sikri has also joined in. Good morning, sir. Yeah. So uh, some of the very interesting takeaways, students and my dear faculty colleagues from, uh, from the lecture was, you know, that you, you cannot just uh, think about, uh, if I could use that kind of a phrase, to launch a public interest litigation. You need to be methodical. You need to have a very uh, reasoned, well-founded uh, belief system in it. And then only your, your, your public interest litigation should be processed. And as Sir has pointed out, that it's not just one kind of a uh, legal action that you're bringing in. You must do a lot of prior research to it. It could be in, in uh, referring to a lot of scientists. If it's an environmental law matter, you must look for a lot of data mining. And then try to also see that what will be executable orders, because because your objective cannot be simply to file public interest litigation and just say that, you know, our job is done. I, I, sir, if I'm not wrong, the, one of the important takeaways could also be that it, you are, you're going to live with that public interest litigation till the order becomes ex executable in its true sense, because that's the reason that you take it to its logical conclusion. So it's, as you've rightly said, that you could be virtually a amicus, but if we can probably extend it further, you could also be you know, watching it over closely and then report it back to the courts of required that the orders were probably if, you know, situations, God forbid, so arises that were not executed or were not satisfactorily executed, right? So your job will only rest there, not just merely going to the court, starting it off there. And then, yes, then the job is over and I need to switch over to the next PIL and next and next, right? Correct. So these are some of my takeaways from this, in, uh, from this lecture. And another interesting aspect, which we all know, so, but uh, you're very uh, impactfully touched, is the institutional reforms. That there have been a lot of gamut of you know, pu public interest litigation, as we've seen since 90s, late 1970s onwards. But the institutional reform is something, I believe, which is uh, taken up uh, in its own shape and is also evolving, I would say, in the, in the contemporary scenario. 
and that's i believe is probably far more challenging i don't know you you could probably you know address that issue that is that more challenging than addressing the issue for example of uh, prison inmates environmental uh, issues and so on and so forth because you, here you're going to be almost one individual lawyer pitted against the mighty state if you're looking at the institutional reforms so how could you really approach at it uh, and sort of balance it in terms of you know making it worthy so that's one of my questions and the and then the uh, floor is open for you know the discussion and you can ask questions my dear friends yes you are right nachiketa the uh, apil uh, regarding institutional reforms is always a more difficult pi because there also it can be said that this is a matter of policy that uh, whether the institution should be like this or like that is a matter of policy and how can the court give directions for example take the case of police reforms now government did say this was their argument that look this is a matter of purely executive policy how the police is regulated who is in charge of the police that uh, is for the government to decide and therefore the court has no business to interfere with this now there in those kind of cases you need to bring to bear the opinions and the reports of various expert committees appointed by the government itself or kind of semi government expert committees which have gone to this issue and made recommendations so they could be the law commission they could be various other uh, bodies uh, appointed by the government for police reforms in fact in prakash singh's case we produced as many as six expert committee reports appointed by the government itself which were all saying the same things that look uh, you need to reform the police this is a colonial uh, police that we have in this country we need to make it somewhat independent of the political executive etc starting from the shah commission then the dharamvira commission then various commissions had been appointed over the last 25 years which had been saying the same things similar things have been said about other reforms in other uh, institutions that are required even about the judiciary law commission has various reports about reforms that are required in the judiciary etc but unfortunately my own experience has been that the courts are most reluctant when you bring a pil on judicial reforms they are usually uh, much quicker to issue orders relating to reforms in other authorities but very reluctant to bring about any judicial reforms through any pil that has been my experience okay yeah that's nice so my uh, dear friends if you want to ask any question please raise hands and i will unmute you and uh, then you can ask yeah shubham you can go first uh very good morning all the dignitaries present over here sir my question is what's your take if we say that through pils courts started working like legislative and executive to enforce directive principles and doing so courts misunderstands their role in the constitution scheme of popular democracy well i don't agree with that view that is a view which uh, many people have which particularly the government has the most governments are very unhappy with the uh, whether on uh, uh, their executive powers or on even uh, on to the or uh, striking down laws etc uh, uh, governments are usually very unhappy uh, about that but i for one uh, feel that although there has occasionally been some judicial ex excess in the sense that some judges who do not understand what is purely a matter of executive policy not involving any fundamental rights or any uh, provisions of the constitution or any law versus those issues which do involve constitutional rights uh, legal rights 
fundamental rights, <coughs> etc. So the courts, you need you need competent judges who understand the difference between matters of pure executive policy not involving any rights versus those matters which do involve either fundamental rights or any other constitutional or legal rights. And in my view, it is perfectly correct for the court to interfere with and give directions to the government or even uh, strike down legislation, et cetera. Of course, uh, the Supreme Court has the power to strike down legislation, Supreme Court and the high courts on the ground that they violate fundamental rights or any other provision of the constitution. So uh, in my view, the activism of the court by and large has been quite justified, even on issues like environment or uh, uh, corruption, et cetera, where, where uh, again, some people can take the view that court has interfered in a matter of government policy, etc. But uh, I don't agree with that view. Yeah, right. Thank you, sir. Uh, so next, uh, Mr. Sanjay, do you want to ask the question? I'm going to unmute. Yeah, Sanjay, you can ask. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I just want to ask a question in context with an article I just recently read in the Atlantic about the U.S. Supreme Court. Over there, they were deciding about the Bridgegate scandal, and somebody's written a very nice article saying that the court decided not to interfere in the policy decision, even though it was very clear that the policy decisions that were made in uh, New York were actually to support a political candidate. The reasoning of the courts over there, the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court, was that, look, these are policy decisions, and as long as the officials have not taken any money directly, Whatever policy decisions they make, whether it is benefiting one political party or not, or a candidate or not, we cannot interfere. And the similar stand has been taken in our Supreme Court also. Uh, speaking through the CJI, the Apex Court said that uh, the government, the executive has all the three M's, uh, the money, the manpower, and uh, materials. So in that case, they also decided to stay away from sticking uh, into the policy decision. So my, my question was more about a jurisprudential and a philosophical uh, aspect as to how, if the courts decide that it is not their realm to enter into the policy and they, they uh, just as Bhagwati, he had actually stepped very actively into the policy making decision and he was very proud of it and other justices like Justice Krishna Iyer have done the same. Now, when the government steps back and says that we don't want to interfere because this uh, governments uh, do what they want to do to help themselves, to, to, uh, and that is as long as that is not corruption, they are allowed to do it. How can we create a justification for our courts or a philosophical and a jurisprudential, jurisprudential justification to, uh, to, to motivate the courts uh, to enter into the policy decisions and make a mark over there like it used to happen earlier after the emergency? What would it take for our courts to do the same? Thanks, that's a question, sir. So, merely because uh, the U.S. Supreme Court didn't interfere with a particular uh, policy, which, I mean, I, I am not aware of what the context was, but if the policy was clearly shown to be malafide, meaning uh, not designed in public interest, but designed in the interest of a political party, then clearly it was the duty of the Supreme Court, even the U.S. Supreme Court, to interfere. And certainly in India, the law and jurisprudence on this is very clear. If a policy is shown to be malafide, that is born out of extraneous considerations, whether money has been taken or not is irrelevant. If it is designed to benefit a particular party, political party, and not designed in public interest. For example, so to take this issue of electoral bonds, if it could be shown from the internal notings of the government that these bonds are being introduced to uh, benefit the ruling party uh, and not in general public interest, then it is the duty of the court to interfere and strike that down. Similarly, if a policy is clearly uh, violating somebody's fundamental rights, for example, the, as I said, the lockdown policy, if it is leading to violation of Article 21 rights of the people, then at least that Article 21 rights have to be redressed. You can't say that uh, 
even if Article 21 rights are being violated and it is possible for the government to redress the violation of those rights, then also the court should not interfere. That, in my view, is a totally wrong jurisprudential view. And that's an abdication of the responsibility of the Supreme Court or the High Courts because it is the duty that the, the, the High Courts and the Supreme Courts have been created primarily to protect the people and their fundamental rights to protect democracy and to ensure that the executive and the legislature legislature remain and function within the bounds of their powers and do not violate fundamental rights or any other rights of the people. Right. Thank you, sir. Nilang, uh, you want to go ahead? Yes, sir. So, good morning. Sir, my question to you is that, uh, as you said, that sometimes courts are reluctant in accepting some judicial reforms or anything which is uh, any PIL entertained due to uh, filed uh, on the basis of judicial reforms or where judiciary is involved. So, so uh, these people obviously feel some kind of, uh, uh, they fear that thing because investigation shows anything like that. So, and due to that, Sir, they you know can file a contempt of court issue and sort of things like that against the person who is going for the public interest litigation. After all, you are doing a public good, and uh, these people are being threatened by that. They raise objections. So, how do we deal with that, sir? Like, yes, uh, and this contempt court is a is a serious problem, and it uh, it has uh, often been used to silence people who speak out boldly against uh, the functioning of the judiciary. Unfortunately, that has become the case. It certainly held out as a threat uh, to uh, independent people and the media from speaking out and criticizing or boldly criticizing uh, the functioning of the judiciary and the courts. In my view, uh, see, contempt of court has three aspects. One is, of course, criminal contempt. One, one is civil contempt, which is disobedience of an order of the court. That is fine. If you disobey an order of the court, you are in civil contempt, you should be punished. Then you have criminal contempt that is of two categories. One is interfering with the administration of justice. So if you uh, do not allow a court to function, you create a nuisance inside the court, or you threaten a judge, you threaten a witness, you threaten a lawyer, that is obstruction of justice. That should also be punishable. But the third category, which is called scandalizing the court or lowering the authority of the court. Now, this is the problematic part of the uh, definition of contempt because this has been used sometimes to punish or at least to threaten people who are exposing the misconduct in the judiciary or who are exposing wrongdoing in the judiciary, or even those who are very, very strongly criticizing the functioning uh, and the actions of the judiciary. In my view, speech should not constitute contempt of court, unless that speech amounts to a threat held out to a judge or a threat held out to a witness or a lawyer, etc., which directly uh, involves interference with or obstruction of judicial proceedings. Right. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Krishna, do you want to go ahead? Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, so much Speak a bit loudly. Uh... Good morning, sir. Is it okay? Hello. <coughs> you must speak Hello. a bit more. Loud. Please be louder. Please be louder. Yeah. Hello. Good morning, Krishna? sir. Yeah, Krishna, yeah. much better. Yeah. 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 So my question is, now that PIL is being converted into political interest litigation, now if a petition has both, a political interest as well as a public interest, in those cases, how does the court deal with it? You see, as I said, that uh, mere fact that uh, the person who has approached the court may have some political interest also. So, so let's take a very concrete example. Let's say that a opposition political party files a PIL in a court challenging electoral bonds and comes to the court and says that, look, these electoral bonds are designed to funnel black money 
into the coffers of the ruling party kickbacks bribes etc are being funneled through electoral bonds to the ruling party and therefore they should be stopped it is also it, uh, it is also negating a level playing field uh, in the political arena uh, and it should be stopped now mere fact that a politic that the petitioner political party may have some interest in the matter does not mean that the matter is not of sufficient public interest or does not raise actionable public interest issues for the court to interfere if it raises actionable public interest issues then the court should deal with it and if the court if at any stage the court finds that it is not getting the kind of assistance that it needs from the petitioner it can always appoint an amicus but that is not a reason for the court to dismiss it but yes there can be petitions which do not raise any issues of public interest which only have a particular political interest in mind Uh, and uh, certainly those should be uh, thrown out there are i mean there are three kinds of uh, pils which need to be thrown out one is irresponsible pils that is people who come to court without studying uh, without going through all the uh, expert opinions on that issue and who just approach the court at the drop of a hat without going through the relevant uh, material and consulting the relevant experts second are those frivolous pils which are filed for saying ki look uh, thursday should be declared a holiday instead of sunday etc i mean some ridiculous thing like that that there are also sometimes those kind of frivolous pils which are filed and then today we have a third category of malafide id or irresponsible pils which need to be thrown out and these should be thrown out with heavy cost which is pils are filed by people who are set up to get that pil dismissed in order to prevent a future pil to be filed by some proper person some examples of that are the pils filed by this mr ml sharma who who moves the court immediately even on rafael he did so but if you see his actions there after in the court he was arguing exactly contrary to what his petition was saying so we have those examples also of what are called setup pils which are filed in order to get a dismissal so that it bars any future genuine pil on that issue these need to be deterred with a very heavy hand thank you so much sir yeah yeah nachiketa uh, sorry before yes, you proceed yes, further yes, i'm yes, sorry yes, taking liberty go ahead go ahead sir so uh, good morning prashant <laughs> good morning sir nice so hearing happy to see you when i came to know yesterday that you were uh, coming as i said i'll definitely join but i told nachiketa i have another meeting at 11 so i okay. wanted to participate in the discussion but then uh, uh, no time left now for me but uh, some other time and uh, all the best stay safe everybody because i have to go for another this thing thank you sir thank you. it's a great honor thank to you. have you thank you thank you thank you sir right Mr. Yogendra, you wanted to ask. Uh, I'm going to unmute you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Supreme Court of Washington allows the uh, proceed uh, live streaming of the proceeding of the courts. I think if the proceeding of lower courts can be allowed in India, it will improve the quality of justice as well as the ra uh, delivery rate of delivery of justice. what do you think prashant sir no no i have been of the view that uh, court proceedings should be live streamed today we have the technology to do that and there is no reason why they should not be live streamed it will certainly uh, help in minimizing and reducing misconduct both by lawyers as well as by judges so because if lawyers and judges are aware as to uh, 
aware of the fact that the whole country can see what they are doing, then their misconduct would greatly reduce. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ankit, do you want to go ahead? Yes, sir. Good morning to all the dignitaries present here. Sir, actually, my question is related to a recent PIL, which the Supreme Court rejected. The PIL was that uh, the term should be used as social distancing, uh, physical distancing, not social distancing. So it is rightly said that, according to my view, that whenever you go to a shops in lockdown, so we have to maintain a so, uh, physical distance, not social distance. So why the Supreme Court has rejected this? Because it has a merit in, in this PIL. So what's your take in that? So in my view, you see the, the, the usage of that word, social distancing instead of physical distancing is not, uh, not of any importance. I mean, uh, everybody understands what it means. Uh, it means that you shouldn't be crowding around people, whether you call it social distancing or physical distancing. So the, these are not the kind of PILs which need to be taken. And the court's time should not be wasted on these kinds of issues. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Akshat? Akshat, you can go ahead. Hello. So. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Good morning, sir. So my question is uh, good morning, sir. So my question is yeah. related to concept of curative petition, sir. So as we all know that this is the uh, remedy provided by the court in the rarest of the rare cases. But sir, as we can see, there are many, many curative petitions have been filed lately. And sir, most of them most of them being uh, resulted into the dismissal by the court. And sir, in also in the recent case of Nirbhaya Reed case also, sir, we can see how the uh, convicts use the method of curative petition and the other remedies also uh, to delay injustice. So, sir, my, my question is, sir, uh, in your opinion, is there a need to change the parameters which were drawn in Rupa Ashok Hurra judgment and the Supreme Court Order 48 on the basis on which the uh, curative petitions are being filed and admitted in the court? So, what What's your opinions? I just want to know that. So in my view, see, uh, till now, I don't think any, I mean, I'm not aware of any curative petition really being allowed by the court. Maybe there has been one. Uh, so, so there have been three actually, total in, in total, sir. Uh, but uh, see, they are listed in chambers. Usually, uh, majority of the judges are the judges who delivered that original judgment. There is no hearing. And usually it is just routinely dismissed. Uh, I don't even know whether judges bother to read the curative petitions or not. Uh, in my view, there should be a short limited hearing which should be allowed in court. Maybe just a five minute or a 10 minute hearing which should be allowed in these for these curative petitions. Uh, then only uh, will the lawyer or the party be able to put forward the real point of view and make be sure that the judges have heard that. But otherwise, I think the parameters that have been laid down are okay. And uh, the system that there should be the senior most three judges. I mean, in my view, if the senior most three judges were the persons who decided the original matter, then there should be some other judges also. But there need to be some uh, other uh, judges also involved, at least two other judges who were not in the original matter. Um, so, right. thank you. Uh, so, just one more Actually. thing. So, just one more thing. Uh, sir, as we can see also that, sir, in curative petitions, there is no uh, time specified, like till when you can file the uh, curative petition. You just said reasonable time, uh, within reasonable time, you can file. However, in review petition, you can file only within 30 days. And uh, sir, even the central government on the, uh, with the help of Ministry of Home Affairs, they filed the application in the Supreme Court that there should be a reasonable time to file the curative petition, sir. So sir, the reasonable time, this bracket, sir, it opens up, it, it, it opens up this curative petition concept to everyone, sir, that uh, they can file it whenever they feel like on any different ground. Sir, which is also, sir, it is counterproductive to the concept of justice on the basis of it's, uh, it was evolved, sir. Yeah, okay. Yeah, actually, I one agree. Question. There should be some time limit for filing curative petitions also. Right. Dipanchu, you can go ahead. 
sir yeah we can hear you uh, good morning sir uh, sir as we all know ncheck was struck down by the pil uh, as it, it strikes the basic structure of doctrine independent judiciary sir don't you think the only judicial service do the same as it also strike down or uh, abridges the independent judiciary no i didn't understand your question yeah you need to clarify sir, that don't uh... you, sir don't you think all india judicial service also attack the independent judiciary doctrine yeah i agree there should be an all india judicial service uh just in the lines of the civil services there should be an all india judicial service uh but we must also really activate all these gram nyayalayas the gram nyayalay act was passed in 2010 or so and 10 years down the line we have still not implemented that act that's a that's a great shame uh, which required these gram nyayalayas to be set up at least at the block level across the country <clears throat> Uh, anybody else indra devi do you want to go ahead um yes sir thank you um yeah. so my question to you is um we have dpsp uh, in, in wherein there are social economic rights in, ingrained in it and we all know that dpsps are not uh, non enforceable and when you, uh, you during your lecture you talked about how pil gives us the opportunity to raise social economic issues so how does the interplay between dpsp and the non enforceability of that play in terms of pil oh, that's my question thank you sir so uh, see if there is a directive principle uh, which uh, which has also been echoed by various expert committees appointed by the government parliamentary committees and various other expert committees on that issue uh, then you can go to court and say that uh, this should be read into uh, one of the fundamental rights itself article 21 or something the time has come to read this into just as article 21 rights have been expanded from time to time Uh, so we can ask for that expansion also in the case of a, a directive principle which has been affirmed repeatedly by various expert committees right thank you sir uh, dr parikshit do you want to ask yes uh, thank you very much sir for the opportunity uh, bhushan sir thank you very much uh, as always it has been a fantastic opportunity to hear you uh, i don't know if you recall probably you wouldn't but i have had the good fortune of interacting with you very extensively 2009 10 11 when i was working with mr tankha when he was uh, asg and uh, sometimes on this side and sometimes on that side you were uh, mostly on the other side sir when um, so sir i have a specific question to you that uh, don't you feel that uh, the rules which have been framed by the supreme court the full court uh, decision of 1988 and which was modified in 93 twice uh, 2003 again uh, don't you feel sir that uh, those kinds of things we have given too much of leverage to the registry to decide what is public interest don't you think in the light of changing public interest ka definition uh, we should be going ahead and changing these because i am asking you this as a teacher of constitution law in delhi university i personally feel that uh, what is public interest sir keeps changing according to time and i don't feel that the registry or the cji should have so much of discretion that's my personal view sir i would like to hear your view sir yeah i mean i am not uh, aware of what exactly the rules are saying regarding this uh, but uh, certainly i do agree that the registry should not be given much power in terms of deciding what's a public interest case and what is not so yes. sir they've confined it you know only bonded labor neglected children non payment of wages um, petition that against that is totally wrong that yes, is totally yes. wrong yes uh, and uh, ultimately it is for the court to decide yes. Whether, yes. whether an issue is a public interest issue or not whether sir. it's an actionable issue or not so therefore it should not be for the registry to decide this yes. sir No, that is what absolutely. Yeah, thank, you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Vipul, uh, you can ask the question. So my question is this: 
many of the pils are pending in the higher high courts and the supreme courts so should we should we have the different roster or the any track for the court to deal with that pending pils okay thank you <clears throat> so unfortunately today most courts are hardly functioning uh, during this lockdown and in fact uh, there is no reason justice shah in his recent interview said that there is no reason even if the courts are functioning through video conferencing why shouldn't the courts function all the judges be sitting through video conferencing and why shouldn't they be hearing at least 30 cases in a day instead of just 6 7 8 10 10 cases so uh, but this is of course the problem today but in general See, there is huge pendency of all kinds, including public interest cases. In my view, that that there should be a specialized bench uh, uh, dealing with uh, or specialized benches dealing with public interest cases, and uh, public interest cases should be on a faster track. But simultaneously, also we need to uh, quicken the whole justice delivery system by appointing more judges by. improving the system of appointing judges so that there are more competent judges by cutting down on uh, unnecessary procedure etc this whole business of how notices are served should be made much simpler uh, so as to make uh, the justice delivery system work much faster in general right thank you sir uh, mr seem sarode do you want to go ahead yes hi sir uh, i want to ask a question uh, regarding uh, human rights code to be set up in india we are fighting since long when we went to the supreme court they said uh, it cannot be entertained here you have to go to the high court because it is in their jurisdiction uh, now according to the human rights protection act uh, it clearly mentions that there shall be district court level human rights court set up special human rights court shall be set up now uh, sir the problem is uh, i think it is very good uh, to decentralize the uh, system and uh, it is not possible for every person to approach the high court and the supreme court for public interest so uh, if we de decentralize this work this can be addressed very uh, easily on the district court level but uh, what problem i see is uh, Uh, the the constitutional power shall be delegated to the district court if they want to function the human rights court uh, since uh, the human rights protection act is in existence there is no implementation of uh, human rights court at the district level what is your say on setting up of human rights court at the district level no in my view they should be set up and uh, there is no reason why the supreme court should not entertain such a petition it is a very important public interest issue which uh, affects the whole country and the supreme court should be entertaining such a petition right thank you sir sahaj uh, will take last two questions yeah. last yeah last two questions sahaj you can ask out in sabrimala judgment the locus standi so sir your view on the concept of locus standi in a pil so the rules of locus standi were uh, liberal yeah. long ago from sp gupta or even before that where uh, in the 80s the court said that uh, any a person who is genuinely interested in a particular public interest cause can come forward it doesn't have to be a directly affected party uh now uh unfortunately sometimes uh, the courts forget that jurisprudence which was made uh, since the 80s onwards whereas uh, when the rules of locus standi were liberalized and unfortunately another reason why people why, why courts sometimes dismiss pils is because they say that you are an interested party now as i pointed out you may be an interested party but you may still have brought an issue of uh, genuine public interest 
uh, which involves uh, violation of rights of a large number of people, etc. And there is no reason why the court should refuse to entertain that merely because you are an interested party. So uh, I think, uh, and sometimes, I mean, the courts function very, very subjectively on these matters. Some courts just dismiss it on this ground. Some courts entertain it. Uh, this is all a result of not having uh, the right kind of judges in place. So this whole business of selection and appointment of judges is very, very important. Current system, uh, see the original system of selecting judges was by the government, which led to political appointments. Today we have a system of selection by the collegium, which uh, is slightly better than the earlier system, but uh, still it involves a lot of uh, nepotism, non-transparency, arbitrariness, etc., which needs to be set right by having a fully uh, full-time and totally independent judicial appointments commission, full-time body, not an ex-official body. Uh, but uh, this is a this is something which nobody wants to do. Right, thank you. Preet Kiran, do you want to just go ahead as the last question? So my question is, on the face of it, if it is uh, clear that substantial public interest is involved and a PIL for the same has been filed, but it is dismissed on the grounds because uh, the uh, individual interest of the judiciary was involved or the judges in the dealing with the case. So what is the relief that a person can seek because the PIL has been dismissed? No, there's not much that can be done. If the Supreme Court has dismissed a petition, all that you can do is file a review or file a curative. Not much that can be done. And of course, if a judge is interested in a particular case, you can ask for his recusal. But unfortunately, today, some judges are taking offense to even an application for recusal and saying that this amounts to contempt, which in my view is a complete abuse of uh, their jurisdiction. They have no business to say that an application for recusal amounts to contempt. Right. So thank you, my, my dear friends. Uh, I, I am sorry we will not be able to take more questions because it has to leave. But, but sir, before that, uh, I'll just take uh, you know liberty and try to repeat some of the five takeaways which I have uh, taken it down here that my dear friends, some of the lawyer friends and also the law students are going to graduate. You must probably remember that the thumb rule one could be that your homework should be perfect, that how you do your data mining in terms of filing a research. And then the second is you must cross check with the constitution and the legal basis for filing the public interest litigation. Third is you must also try to look at its feasibility, the executability of the order that may come out from the Supreme Court or the High Court, that how will it actually uh, be uh, uh, you know, translated into action. And the fourth is that, as Sir has rightly said, that individual interest could be subsumed in the larger public interest. So, so what is important is that somebody who is filing is going to be more important and if the time may warrant, the court may ask you to step down and you can look at yourself as the in the role of the amicus. And probably if I can sum up the fifth one could be that the ethical role, which was the sum and substance of the entire lecture today, that whose purse and whose brief are you carrying? Is it that the interest is of public? And if so, then are you going to be governed and influenced by somebody's purse? for that particular brief, which was in the public interest, as I said, that if you would begin to charge money for the public interest cases, then probably there'll be conflict between the brief and the purse, and that may you know, affect the entire process of public interest lawyering. So, so that, that's how I wanted to sum up in that sense. But yeah, with the summary. last comments, we can wind up. That's a very good summary. Thank you very much, Nachiketa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for, for coming over. And I'll speak to you then once again later. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, all dear friends, uh, for watching us today with uh, uh, Mr. Prashant Bhushan's lecture on ethical approach to public interest lawyering. So, thank you for uh, for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.